Have you ever thought about how amazing the human body is? King David sure did. In Psalm 139, he reflects and says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David knew his creator and that his body was a masterpiece. Well, so is yours. God's affection for you is so profound that he created everyone, everywhere, uniquely in his own image. Discover the amazing details and the many miracles that have to take place in each step of the process of fetal development all the way to birth. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Created in God's Image, Part 2. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. We have a very interesting program for you, Created in God's Image, Part 2. And we've got Amanda here in the guest chair with us. She was a host of a recent Origins special, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Amanda, tell us more about the program we're going to be seeing today. Sure. In Part 2, we're going to continue to take a closer look at how each of us are conceived, carried to term, and entered this world. Being a mother of four, I can certainly appreciate learning more about what was actually going on during my pregnancies. Much of that you'll see today about the miracle of birth was compiled over time by the late renowned anatomist, Dr. David Menton. Yes, these segments were taped several years before Dr. Menton's passing. Now let's go to the Creation Museum with the help of Origins host emeritus, Dr. Don Chapman, will discover a vital structure in a woman's body that supports the baby for the whole nine months. Let's put it this way, we wouldn't be here without it. We were talking about how we are so fearfully and wonderfully made by God. About 30 hours after fertilization right here, we uh, get two cells instead of one cell. And you'll notice those two cells are no bigger than the one cell. Right. And when it divides again, say at three days here, we get a ball of cells. So that's about three days after fertilization, we arrive at the uterus. Well, here we are uh, at the uh, four day stage, uh, more cells yet, still a tiny bulb. Notice the red around the outside here. That's that zone of pellucida we were talking about, that shell, it's our eggshell. And that will be soon lost after this uh, stage, four days. And from then on, the cells can pretty well stick together without being inside of a, a shell. Well, moving on to uh, uh, the next stage, a space is developed in the middle of this grouping of cells. And uh, we call this the blastocyst. This is the blastocyst on the point of a pin in the scanning electron microscope. Of a pin. Yeah, the point of a pin magnified wow. highly. Here it is here. This is the space inside the ball here. And uh, notice it's a little thicker over on the side. You're probably wondering, out of all this, uh, where's the baby? Yeah. <laughs> well, the baby is called the inner cell mass. It's right there. Only the cells in this green circle are actually going to develop to form the baby. Kind of makes you wonder what all the other cells around here are doing, doesn't it? We call those cells the trophoblast cells. They're separate cells. And they're going to make something maybe you forgot about, but we better have it if the baby's going to develop any further. And that is, we need the placenta. Okay. Okay. So trophoblast cells out here make the placenta. This area in here, the inner cell mass is going to make the baby. And we need to get working on the placenta to get it started to support the baby as it grows. No placentas, no babies. No babies, we wouldn't need placentas. Two <laughs> things, and the placenta isn't the mother, and it isn't the baby. It's a third thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the placenta is the most underrated organ in the body. It does such a marvelous job for us, and when the baby's born, everybody's so excited about the baby, we just throw the placenta away. It's very friable, it breaks down very quickly, it has almost no lifespan to it at all. 
And yet that amazing organ has supported that baby in a way that few people uh, recognize. You know, it's, it's one of the most, if not the most important organ in our body. We wouldn't be here without it. And yet none of us had our own placenta in our own body. No, that's right. Uh, the placenta, when you think about it, is rather like this plug here. <laughs> okay. You know, this could be hooked up to a computer or one of our TV cameras here, and those computers or cameras would not work if they weren't plugged in. And you think when you plug them in, there's just a couple of holes in a wall that can't amount to much, but there's an entire power plant. <laughs> and that's what the placenta really is. It's like the entire power plant. It does so many things. And uh, we'll see some of the things that it does uh, as we uh, look into the marvelous development of the placenta. Right. So we want to look at this process of implantation. It's going to occur at five and a half to six days after fertilization. The blastocyst, with its inner cell mass, which is making the baby, is going to penetrate right through the wall of the endometrium, usually on the back side, dorsal side. Now, that shouldn't happen biologically. These are two different human beings we're talking about here, mother right. and the baby. There should be a graft rejection going on here, <laughs> but it doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, the endometrium welcomes this placenta, which behaves almost like a cancer cell. It penetrates right on through the tissue. We would call that invasive if that, if that were a tumor. Uh, here's a drawing of that process. Notice the blue again is the inner cell mass that's developing into the baby. baby. We need to get this placenta going. And right here on this outer surface, these cytotrophoblast cells are starting to do something interesting. They fuse together. So if you had two trophoblast cells when they fuse, you now have one cell. It's twice as big, but it has two nuclei. Huh. Then a third one fuses. Now you have three nuclei, bigger yet. And it just keeps fusing and fusing and fusing. Uh, here's the penetration going right through the endometrial wall. That's these fused cells that are highly invasive, the syncytial trophoblast. And this is what the placenta looks like. A lot of people uh, are familiar, at least this is what it looks like at term. And it's about nine inches across, and it does some absolutely amazing things. Uh, for example, uh, the placenta serves as a lung. So the placenta, with the help of the mother, is serving as a lung which allows the baby's lungs to develop without having to be at least fully used. Right. And this is true of all the organs in the body. In fact, it's probably easiest to tell you what the placenta doesn't do. It's not a heart, doesn't pump blood. That's why the heart has to develop very early in the embryo, get that big cardiac prominence. Uh, it doesn't make blood, so the baby has to make its own blood. The two bloods never mix. And uh, it's not a brain, it's not a central nervous system. So uh, it's a lung. It's a liver, in fact, it's all the digestive glands of the body, again, with the help of the mother. It's the whole gastrointestinal tract for digesting food. Uh, it's the whole urinary system, the kidneys. Now, the baby uh, has kidneys that do function. Some urine is produced that goes into the amniotic fluid, but the main function is still being done by the mother. Uh, it's an endocrine gland, produces hormones, and finally, it protects the baby. It's the immune system with the help of the mother again to provide antibodies for the now, baby. Now, how big is that again? It's about nine inches across, about an inch or so thick in the middle. And you know, when that uh, placenta unplugs from the uterine wall, <laughs> that's the biggest wound any human being ever gets and lives to tell a story. It truncates a dozen or so arteries and veins that are nearly the size of soda straws. At term like this, all of the blood of the mother is going through that placenta every 10 minutes. Wow. So when the placenta unplugs, you ought to get total ensanguination, that is total blood loss of the mother in 10 minutes. That's a bad wound. Yes, sir. But we survive it, how? We survive it by the Lord providing a hemostat, a little clamp on every one of those vessels. It's like a drawstring or a purse string. And when that placenta unplugs, the drawstring stays with the mother, doesn't go with the baby, and it clamps down right away. Instead of losing all the blood of the mother in 10 minutes, maybe a cup of blood in a normal delivery. So God has built a, a string that ties that off so the mother vessel. doesn't bleed, get yeah, on, on every, every vessel. Yeah, it's amazing. And this is the way the placenta looks uh, kind of diagrammatically here. Um, it's like a grove of trees, about 20 little trees, each with a trunk and branches and twigs. Here's one of the trees right here, but notice it's upside down, the trunk mm -hmm. faces up. Uh, baby's blood is running inside the trunk and branches and twigs of those trees. 
We call this tree a cotyledon. And there's about 20. And the crown of the tree is about the size of a marble. Yeah. So when you look at so the surface that comes yeah. off the endometrium, it looks lumpy. Those are the tops of the little trees. <laughs> Where's mother's blood? Mother's blood is coming in from these uterine arteries here. And it's almost like taking a hose and splashing it right on a shrub or a tree. It just literally fills in the whole space around all these trees. So baby's blood is like the sap inside the tree. Mother's blood is like the wind blowing through the trees. <laughs> and if we uh, look at the development of the placenta here at 40 days, uh, this is a fairly early level of the placenta. Notice the placenta at that stage goes all the way around the baby. It's not a disc as it is later. And it looks like cotton candy out here, doesn't it? Yeah. That's all these trees packed together, or these cotyledons. One of the trees might look like, for example, this yellow uh, lines here. That would be one of the trees. And about 20 of those will serve the mature placenta. If we just cut the tip off from one of these little branches, right at the very end of the twig, this is what it looks like under the scanning electron microscope we see that the surface area is increased even further by these little tiny microvilli that <laughs> uh, protrude uh, from the surface of the villus. Now let's make a, a slice right across the end of that little tiny villus. This is the tiniest twig on one of these little trees or cotyledons. And look at it in cross section, and this time in the light microscope. And here is one of the little twigs right here. Now this red blood cell in the inside belongs to the baby. This red blood cell on the outside belongs to mom. And so baby's blood in here, in this area, and mother's blood all in this space out here like the wind going through the twigs, those two bloods are separated by this pink line here, see? Yeah. And that pink line is called a syncytial trophoblast. It formed from all of the cell fusion we were talking about before. They calculate that the total surface area of this thing, which is, by the way, believed to be one cell covering the surface of the placenta, so it's seamless. One cell separating mother's blood from baby's blood, and it would be roughly the area of a living room area rug, eight by 11 feet, seamless one cell. I got a question for you, Doc. How's dumb luck working for you? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's just so interesting. Who can believe this? Made. Who yeah. can believe this is dumb luck? It's yeah. not possible. Unless you're an atheist, then, then it would be how else? I mean, if you're dead certain there's no God, then how else nature has to do this? So, so you, you become an atheist because you refuse to believe the option of God, so therefore you deny all the evidence that shows he's there at work. Right, and it gets to a point where evolutionists often say things like that, that uh, a mindless, purposeless process of evolution must have happened or we wouldn't be here. Because God's no longer an option. Hey, isn't it great to be a Christian? We not only have oh. heaven waiting for us, but here on earth, we can be rational. <laughs> yes. The placenta, the most important organ for every person. Oh my goodness, so he called it the power plant. When you think of a power plant, that's like in charge of everything that's gonna go on in a whole entire plant, and it's true. It, I mean, the placenta, takes care of what the operation of the lungs, the liver, the glands, the GI tract, the kidneys, endocrine gland, immune system, and then the thought that the mother's blood, the entirety of my blood, flowed through my placenta in 10 minutes. This is miraculous. Amazing. And you know how God designed it that when the baby's born, the placenta disconnects the vessels close off so the mother doesn't bleed, bleed to death. Amazing. Amanda, we have to stop right there and take a short break. Join us for the final journey of the baby into this world when we come back. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter. 
which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome back to Created in God's Image, Part 2. Our show today has featured some segments from the origin special, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. I'm happy to be on the set with the studio host of the special, Amanda Brocker. Amanda, isn't it great to be talking about our creators having made us in His image fearfully and wonderfully? It is amazing just to see, you know, the miracles that have to take place for just one baby to be born. Now let's go to the Creation Museum with featured guest, the late Dr. David Menton. We'll discover the intricate details of a 12-week-old fetus like fingerprints, facial expressions, hearing capability, and response to touch. Let's go back and pick up where we left off and show the people this amazing thing that God is up to. That barrier between mother's blood and baby's blood is a seamless cell called syncytial trophoblast. It forms from millions, probably trillions of cells that fuse together. And when you look at the picture here, you see the nuclei from the various cells grouped into little puddles here, a little puddle here, a little puddle. In other words, keep it out of the way so there's a thin layer across which to transfer everything that the baby needs or that the baby needs to get rid of. So for example, water passes across that barrier, oxygen, CO2. Yeah. Now the interesting thing, there are a lot of things that have to go across that barrier that will not go across on their own. Uh, for example, a baby has to make its own blood, right? Because the two bloods are separate. To make blood, it needs to make hemoglobin. To make hemoglobin, uh, it needs iron. Its only source of iron is from mother's blood out here. And if I got bad news for you, iron doesn't cross the placental barrier on its own. We need a protein, a transport protein called transferrin, and it's a huge protein. It's a specific combination of 670 amino acids of 20 different kinds that give the property to transferrin that allows it to pick up iron from mother's blood, carry it across what would otherwise be a barrier, and release it to baby's blood. And it's one of several transport proteins. Yeah. That's one of at least 100,000 different proteins in our body. We're talking about one. The probability of putting transferrin together by chance is so remote that if that's all evolution had to do, it would be impossible because of lack of time and material in the universe to even come up with transferrin. Well, let's move on and check on the baby. This is the way a baby would look at seven weeks. You can see this umbilical cord up here. Uh, that umbilical cord has three vessels running in it. It has two uh, arteries that are coming from the baby's, actually from the baby's legs. Vessels, that's why there's two, two legs. <laughs> coming to the placenta, carrying unoxygenated blood in an artery and then the placenta brings back one umbilical vein uh, that is bringing oxygenated blood back to the baby. And uh, it's very important these vessels don't kink. You see how they're kind of twisted around here. You know, you can ask a mom, these babies do loop-to-loops and wing-overs and all kinds of movements inside the body. Sure. You'd think that cord would get kinked and tied in a knot. But there's a marvelous tissue in there that separates those three vessels. It's called Wharton's Jelly. Wharton's jelly is the springiest, spongiest stuff you've ever seen, and it keeps the, the cord from kinking. We look at a baby like this, uh, it's seven weeks. At eight weeks, we call it a fetus rather than an embryo. And by fetus, we mean all of the basic components are there. They just have to mature. Little one. Yeah. It's not ready to be born yet, but the components are there. Milk teeth appear. 99% uh, of the muscles uh, are already there. Uh, at eight weeks, we call this the fetal period. Let's jump a little bit past eight weeks. At a 12-week fetus, this would still be a very tiny little baby, a matter of just a few inches long. Uh, but even at 12 weeks, this baby would have all of the basic components. For example, it would have fingerprints. If you needed to fingerprint it, you could do it now. <laughs> it has fingernails at 12 weeks facial expressions, and facial expressions are not a small deal. There's 45 muscles in our face just to have facial expression. And facial expression is a language that was not confounded at the Tower of Babel. 
Every culture, every society uses the same expressions. A smile's a smile, yeah, a frown is a frown. That, that's right. You know, if you just use two muscles to smile, it looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> it takes about 20 muscles, including muscles in the eye, to get a genuine smile. Wow. Well, the baby has it here at 12 weeks. It has hair on its face, fine uh, hair. And by the way, the baby's going to be born with all the hairs it's ever going to have in its whole life. Wow. <laughs> they just get a little further apart. Uh, what else? The baby is capable of swallowing. It does, in fact, drink amniotic fluid, which uh, is then uh, eliminated from the baby back into the amniotic fluid. Uh, the baby can respond to touch. Uh, it can grasp objects in its hand. If you touch its hand, it tends to grasp. And uh, it can suck its thumb. By the way, not long after this, at about 18 weeks, the baby is capable of hearing, just as we do. Uh, it can hear the mother's heartbeat, which would be very loud to the baby. Uh, it can hear music and voices. Well, we need to jump to the end here. We, we took the first week of development, and we're going to kind of skip over that and go to the term. And when we get to term, it looks something like uh, you see in this drawing here. Uh, I'm happy to announce our baby has done well. It's reached term. The umbilical cord hasn't been tied in knots or anything like that. It's in the good position, heads down. But Don, we have a really big problem I need to bring up here. The baby isn't going to fit through the birth canal. And it's not just tissue that's in the way, Don, it's bone. Uh, this is a illustration of the human female pelvis, the hip bones. Uh, this is the inlet of the pelvis here. The baby's head generally fits down in there quite nicely. The problem is the outlet. You see, it's like a funnel. It's a good thing we uh, males don't have the babies because our pelvis has a real funnel shape. Uh, ladies have a broader funnel. Uh, but the pelvic outlet down here at the bottom still will not allow the baby's head to fit through. Well, what's the solution here? Oh my goodness, this solution is just amazing. This joint right here is the famous sacroiliac joint. Sacroiliac joint. Okay. It's a ligament that holds the bones together. And then right up in front we have the pubic symphysis where the bones fuse. And those joints are softened by an enzyme that allows the hips to swing open just a little further. Now, you don't want to dissolve altogether. The hip will fall apart in three pieces on each side. Uh, but it softens it up just a little bit. And the baby's head still doesn't fit. It has to be turned 90 degrees like a key in a lock. And then it's born. And uh, I think that's just one huge miracle. One of the problems, as soon as a baby's born, it wants to start using its lungs. But during development, the lungs have been mostly bypassed, and they've been bypassed right here. There's a big artery that goes from the vessel going to the lung uh, that shunts the blood from, instead of going to the lung, puts it right into the aorta. That's great when the baby's in the womb and getting its oxygen from the mother, but as soon as the baby's born, this big vessel has to clamp off, becomes a ligament, and now for the first time, all of the blood from the right side of the heart is going to the baby. It clamps off and becomes a ligament. It changes what it is and does. That's right, and we all have that ligament in our body as a testimony. Now, you aren't going to get through this whole program without seeing my grandson. He was born two it. months premature, and here he is in the neonatal intensive care. He, he did well. He got through it all. But whenever I look at this picture, I think seven months of development, uh, that happens to be the age of John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb uh, when Mary and Elizabeth got together. And here to me is one of the most profound statements in Scripture, Luke chapter 1, verse 44. Elizabeth says to Mary, For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Now, every mother knows babies kick. This is Scripture here, though. This baby didn't just kick. John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb heard the voice, which indeed babies can hear through the womb, heard the voice of his Savior's mother. He leaped for joy. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's not enough to be uh, born once. <laughs> we need to be born twice. And we've been talking about the first birth, Don, and it's amazing, isn't it? But you know what? It's nothing compared to the second birth when it comes to amazing. First birth was just physical, but the second birth is spiritual. Here we have in John 3, verses 3 to 4, Jesus answered him, talking to Nicodemus, and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus asked the question I probably would have asked if I was there. He said, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You don't get it, do you, Nick? 
This is a spiritual rebirth that takes a man dead in trespasses and sin and turns him around off in a whole new direction. How about that for a birth for you, huh? You know, Dr. Men, um, the thing that I love about you is your incredible knowledge of the human body is unbelievable. And yet, uh, at the same time, it is complemented by this great spiritual insight. You know, we do this show to let you see that there's a creator. But I want you to understand it's not enough to know he's your creator. You need to know that he's your savior. That the God who always existed became one of us, became a baby like the baby we saw, and lived the only perfect life ever lived so that he could give that life to be a ransom for your sin, that you could be right with God, that you could have the greatest miracle of all, the miracle of rebirth in Jesus Christ. You know what I liked at the end and, and how they both transitioned you know, to the salvation of, of Jesus Christ and, and the second birth that the Holy Spirit has to do. And that's what we're really about here in Origins. We're, 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 not, we're, we're interested in defending the Bible, but we're interested in defending the Bible because that's the Word of God to sinners to save us from our sins. And Jesus has done that. And we want you to know that maybe you know someone or maybe you yourself has had an abortion and ended the life within. There is repentance to Jesus. There's forgiveness, there's healing. He's not holding it over your head and he loves you. And that child is with the Lord. He is in the presence of Almighty God. There's forgiveness in Christ if we believe in him. It just goes to show that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof, it's all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, make a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time right here on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2411, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.